Oh, I'm not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to come okay, listen. To yeah. I'm trying to entice my students. So I have one watching with me in here. So we'll have to make sure she gets counted. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just begin. What do you think? Shelby, you're recording. We're all good to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here um, for our hemp by uh, Wisconsin Hemp by Hand uh, workshop and lecture series. Uh, this is our third lecture focused primary on, primarily on textiles, hemp for textiles. My name is Marianne Fairbanks. I'm an associate professor at UW Medicine. I'm joined here by Shelby Ellison, who is an ass assistant professor in horticulture here at UW Medicine. I think we're the only two on this particular research project on this call right now. Um, but our intention is to gather um, as much information as we can to kind of fulfill the promise of this amazing plant and its potential in this state. And um, I'm a textile person, so I wanna know what we can do with it in relationship to weaving and other textile production. Um, Shelby is growing it, so we, she needs to know all th that information. And today we have with us Tyler Jenkins, who is our invited guest speaker today. Um, we're so thrilled to have you, Tyler. Thank you for joining us. Um, Tyler Jenkins has been organizing and growing industrial hemp for uh, research trials since 2015 with the support from Fibershed. Over the last decade, he has worked with numerous public and private settings, um, building and moving towards resilient, thriving local communities in the field of agriculture, public health, and economic development. Tyler is the organizer of the One Acre Exchange Project, building local economies through regenerative, regenerative agriculture. And so um, Shelby and I are both so eager to have you. And I think all of these people here with us today also are eager to hear from you. So I'm going to introduce you, Tyler, let you take over and um, share the screen so you can have your presentation. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, really, really excited to be here today. Um, yeah, so what I have for you today is basically a series of images that I'm going to talk about from our work in North Carolina over the last um, five years. I'll probably talk for 20 or 25 minutes. Um, I'll try to cover as much as I can, but I know I'll miss some things um, and hopefully leave a lot of time for questions. So um, write those down or put them in the chat or, or however you guys want to do that. Um, yeah, so Marianne, if you want to go to the first slide, we'll just get started. Um, is, it, is it up for you, Shelby? Okay. Oh. My first slide, not this one, that one. <laughs> oh, excuse me, sorry, past the title slide, yes. So hemp in North Carolina, these are our lessons from field growth. So, <clears throat> forgive me. Um, this first image just give you an idea of setting. So um, I grow uh, industrial hemp through a variety of, of different trials. I've done a quarter acre grow um, in, in sort of like a community garden plot. Uh, we've done a one acre uh, grow uh, near Durham, North Carolina, which is like in the center of the state. Um, I've done a variety trial, which we'll talk about a little bit in the eastern part of North Carolina with some different varieties. Um, and North Carolina, if you're not, not familiar, is, is a very interesting uh, state geographically, topographically. We have everything from the mountains to the sea, you know, and uh, kind of everything in between. So what you see here is some rolling hills in the Piedmont of North Carolina, about an hour east of Charlotte. And uh, a lot of cotton is grown in this area. These are where the Uari Mountains are, U-W-H-A-R-R-I-E, some of the oldest um, geologic uh, formations in the United States. So a lot of big rolling hills. Mm -hmm. uh, in the front of that image there is, is Jeff Griffin. Jeff is a conventional farmer who has been transitioning his operation to regenerative practices over the last 20 years. Um, he's been farming his entire life. Um, he's been cutting that field right there since the Nixon administration. So <laughs> he, uh, he knows what grows on it, um, knows things around it. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Sorry. Oh, Come in. Uh, there we go. All right. So that's a picture of our first emergence. So what you can see from from this image is that this crop was drilled. Um, so 
utilizing just machines, we wanted to do a big grow this year. This was for a client who was trying to see what seven acres would look like. And so those sort of uniform rows you see um, of, of crop coming up are because we used a, a drill uh, our drill seeder. Um, if you're if you're not familiar with that, maybe you do organic agriculture and you do a lot of uh, broadcast seeding. Uh, we have some images of that too. We've done some broadcast seeding work. Um, the biggest difference in broadcast seeding or drill seeding uh, from from the perspective of industrial hemp will be the seeding rate. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, you can see here that we are are kind of uh, yeah, this is not this is not a great image to see at this point <laughs> in the season. We've got a little bit of spread here, but nothing that would would qualify as a really thick stand. Um, we had some issues getting some rain here, out competing summer weeds. Um, this you know hemp is an oil seed crop, so you can take some principles from growing sunflowers or or, or other oil seed crops um, that that really will. will um, you know, translate. Um, but some of the things we're really trying to figure out are our seeding rate and, um, and the right sort of conditions and time to grow it. When we first started growing, the advice that we had got was um, grow it any or start planting anywhere from the beginning to the middle of May. Um, now we, we, we've, we're already in the ground right now with our seed this year. And I know farmers who put it in the ground at the end of March. Um, so what we're seeing is that if we don't put it in the ground early, uh, it's hard to outcompete summer weeds um, mm. and that kind of that kind of stuff. So a couple of little notes there. Uh, you can go to the next slide. That right there is comparison. So on the left, you have industrial hemp, um, which has a nice taproot. On the right, uh, though, you can see pigweed, um, very common um, field weed down here in North Carolina. So I'm sure around everywhere it's a type of amaranth that's really spiky and has thorns on it. Um, but you can see what kind of kind of root system it's competing against. Uh, we really wanted to try to do an organic crop with this one. Um, so we sprayed a vinegar solution for, for kind of a straight burn down. And we had a, a rain schedule. Um, if you spray vinegar or spray other things uh, on your field, you know that especially after several weeks of drought, you know, crops really are wanting to suck up as much water as they can get. So we try to apply a vinegar solution right before a rain um, so that it, it takes it up, um, takes that vinegar up while it also takes up the, the water. It didn't rain that night. And so we, we sprayed a bunch of vinegar, which is expensive um, and just had to live with what we got. So uh, just some of the, the real real about growing industrial hemp. There's a, we've, we've got some, some of the big sexy pictures of 10 foot tall hemp too, but this is, this is more what you're likely to see. <laughs> um, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is the seed that we've used uh, that year. That I believe is Pheromon 17. We've grown ooh, 10 or 12 different varieties at this point. Um, several varieties of French seed, several varieties of Italian seed, um, some Ukrainian seeds, some Polish seed, um, a Chinese variety called Gen Ma. Um, and, uh, and a few others. Um, our most success has been with a couple of French varieties, particularly one called Futura, Futura 75. Um, at this point in industrial hemp, if I haven't seen it grow, <laughs> I don't believe it yet. Um, so, uh, so Futura 75 is one I've seen had real success here as a fiber crop. And so that's the one that I'm growing this year. And that I've been recommending to people because it is relatively easy to find. Um, you can get it from a French agricultural growers co-op. Um, they are they're quite reliable. Um, so anyway. Um, next slide. This is the field where we use Future 75 most successfully. Um, as you can see right there, this is not an organic field. So uh, that square in the middle has been burned down um, with uh, something pretty nasty. And then we got the local fire department to come by and, and help us burn it down. This field had been fallow for about 20 years. This particular crop, we wanted to see um, what sort of regenerative capacities hemp would have over a, a field that was pretty, frankly dead 
and, and how well it would grow um, given minimal inputs and doing broadcast seeding. Um, mm -hmm. So these are just a, a, a bit of a picture of kind of different variety, different sort of types of context and, and environments we've tried hemp in. Um, go to the next slide. Here's that same field after we burned it down um, and spread a little bit of compost on it and about 100 pounds of lime and phosphate. And um, yeah, we're, we're broadcast seeding here in this picture. Um, so we, industrial hemp, they'll tell you to seed at a rate of around 50 pounds per acre. I can tell you that that is, is low. Uh, it's low for for several reasons. Number one, it's low because that's what we're looking at, and um, you know, follow that much more than than what we hear nowadays. Um, but also, the seed is not really adapted to our climates just yet. Um, it's hard to predict how well it's going to grow. So, really, just thinking about what what you want out of the crop is helpful here. Um, the farther apart you grow hemp, the more bushy it gets. The more like a you know, like a, um, a bush, <laughs> like a blueberry bush or something like that, it, it grows. So um, certain varieties will come with recommendations for how many plants you want to get per square foot to get a stand. Uh, and the idea is that you, you want him to reach up to the sky, you know, as high as it can. And so the more um, plants that around it has to compete with, the higher it'll shoot up to try to compete for that sun. And the longer hemp you'll get, with less herd, uh, which is easier to cut down and easier to process. And particularly if you're going for textile applications, um, you want more of that fast fiber and less of that, that woody core. Um, it's important to think about because for business model's sake, because the ratio is roughly 70 to 30 woody core to fast fiber. Um, so, um, the more you can maximize that bass fiber production, the better. And the bass fiber is sort of on the outside of that stalk. And so we, we've really increased our seeding rates this year. I'm not seeding anything less, and this is even drilling, um, than 80 pounds per acre um, this year to get a good stand. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Here is a, a um, schematic of a variety trial that we did. So you see we've got seed rates. Tony Cleese uh, is an old um, friend. Um, he was, he, he passed away not too long after this, um, but he's an organic seed guru. Um, and we were really thrilled to have his support for this variety trial here. So this is his writing and, and his words there. You can see uh, 2017. Um, in August. So we did Fairmont, we did USO, USO 31, Fedora 17, Santhica 27, CS is Carmagnola Select, that's an Italian variety, Futura 75, Carmagnola, and then Felina 32. Um, and so we're setting up a variety trial, just, um, just how we did that, how we, we wanted to compare different varieties. And so that's just to show you some of the, the stuff we've grown here in, in North Carolina. Uh, you can go to the next slide and see a, uh, a field of, um, these are some mostly male plants we're looking at here uh, in a field of, of Jin Ma, which is a Chinese variety. Uh, you can skip one more slide actually. And if you look closely, you can see three or four different bees on this plant. Um, one of the things we saw immediately when we planted hemp is that bees and doves started to just gravitate towards them. Um, so a lot of bees, a lot of doves. Um, it's just a cool spot to show there. Uh, you can go one more slide. This is a back shot of Tony there, hauling ha 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 away some hemp from a variety trial. And then um, Carlos in, in the front there is loading some hemp into the back of the truck. You see behind them is a field of uh, tobacco growing. So it kind of represents our, our transition possibility here. Um, but we're getting those ready for comparison, and you can see these are, are pretty bushy. I mean, they're, they're not very long um, as far as we, we wanted to get, but for a first variety trial, they, they weren't too bad. Um, you can go one more slide, and we'll see a seven-acre field that we did. It's a little bit harder to see. 
Um, this is interesting. This was an organic grow. Uh, one thing you can probably see uh, here pretty easy is that, that there's a lot of weeds in this. Um, hemp is, is a really tough, I mean, it's a tough crop, but if you don't get the exact right conditions, if you don't clear your field right, um, if you don't seed at a certain rate, if your seed rate germination is, is lower than, than, um, than it should be, you're going to have a real tough time in an organic application and even a non-organic application if you can't get a, a thick stand. So we got a lot of hemp out of that grow. You can click one more, show you a little bit better shot. Um, so you can see kind of behind that first little bit in the, in the ground, we've got a pretty good stand um, in, that, in that line back there. So uh, behind that first bit of bush and foreground. Um, that was our, our Futura 75 grow. Um, yeah, we, uh, I'll give a few housekeeping notes. Um, seeding rate um, here was about 70 pounds per acre. <clears throat> so you see, we got a good stand with 70. We're still going to increase it a little bit. Um, and we drilled this to about a half inch into the ground. Um, that's, that's about the depth that we, we tend to grow um, when we drill. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So this is really important here and starting to look around, we wanted to, uh, there's several different people doing processing in our state at various levels, um, small artisan groups that we've worked with up to um, groups trying to scale some piece or some pieces of technology. One of the things I really wanted to focus on is what our farmers already had to get it to a place where it could be be moved and sold uh, or post-processed. Um, what you'll find here is an old sickle bar mower. Lots of farmers uh, used to cut fields with this. Um, not a lot of them still running around. You still see some farmers doing it, uh, cutting fields with this, but lots of times um, there'll be a farmer that has one sitting in, the, in a garage or in a, in a barn somewhere. And that was the case with this one. And so we got this moving again and use this to cut this, uh, this field you see behind them down. Um, one of the issues with hemp is that it's, it's best processed, you know, one of the first decisions you have to make about going to a market, uh, let's say you get a good stand and you get it up. Well, now what do you do with it? Do you cut it down and roll bale it? That's the easiest thing for most farmers to do. Or do you cut it down and, and hand harvest it? Um, or, or, you know, in an ideal um, scenario, if you have like sort of a, a reaper binder kind of set up to harvest wheat. Can you, can you lay it down in bundles to where it can then be processed end to end? Um, there are experiments going on with um, processing hemp fiber from, from you know, big field roll bales and, and also experiments with long staple fiber uh, processing, but they're very different processes, very different markets, very different uh, labor considerations and machine considerations right out of the field. So some of the work we've done is trying to figure out you know, what can the farmer do? And then, and then what's the ideal sort of connection point? Um, you know, whether it's long staple fiber or herd or just a big rolled bale of biomass. Um, you can go to the next slide. And you see that sickle bar mower there is making pretty quick work of it. It cuts it down. Uh, one of the reasons that you want to get a really tall stand is that if you grow hemp too thick um, and you want to cut it, Ideally, you know, what I've heard, and again, <laughs> there's more grapevines and more voices coming through it in industrial hemp than, than many things I've ever experienced. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thinner you can, uh, the more thicker that you can get a seeding rate, you get thinner stalks, and obviously they're easier to cut down. Um, after going through this field, that sickle bar mower really needed to be oiled and cleaned. Um, because we had a lot of hemp in there that was the size of your pinky or bigger. Mm. And at that point, you're, you're getting a pretty tough, you know, you're, you're basically cutting down a field of saplings. Um, so you want to try to think about considerations that will be easy on your equipment. Mm. Um, what we're doing this year is we're growing a small grow. We're doing a half acre to an acre grow, doing a really thick process. We have a market that we're excited about. We're going to cut with this same sickle bar mower. And then we're going to have that group come and hand harvest and separate hemp from 
from weeds and, and just kind of do a, a volunteer crop mob kind of thing for that stage of the process. Uh, you can go one more slide. And that's that field after it's been cut down. You can see there's a lot to pick through. Um, so another idea we had is can we roll bale it, take it to the barn and then unroll it immediately and then pick it out there. So we're picking out in kind of a smaller barrel uh, as you were than, than this field. The other thing is, is, is the better, the thicker and better you can get your hemp, less weeds, you know, you're just kind of, you want to just be gathering as much hemp as possible on your runs if you're going to put um, a field labor through here. I mean, I was actually excited about this piece. You know, there was a, a one market that really, uh, one of the things that really excited me about hemp was the, you know, the the idea that, that there was so much risk um, in the board, you know, for the farming and the processing, et cetera, that it was unlikely that big mechanized processes were going to, to invest in this for the first five to seven, eight years. And that's really been borne out. Um, so, you know, us artisan groups and sort of small machine um, type minded folks, there's really a, an opportunity to kind of get in and figure out some early considerations in this market. Um, maybe we figure out some processes that that can scale and can be you know sold to the big guys for the use of the you know of what we're trying to do with appropriate technology. Uh, maybe there's you know a business model out there that allows for distributed sets of of small manufacturers as opposed to, to a couple of big you know gin like setups. So um, I think really you know kind of being innovative and and thinking about um, you know, ways to do this on a small scale right now is is the is the ticket um, because it's still, you know, very expensive to grow hemp. You're looking at this field right here, so um, it's a good thing to talk about economics a little bit. So uh, this is our fifth year growing. I got seed for six dollars a pound this year, and I got it at a deal. You know, and so six dollars a pound times, you know, eighty pounds an acre is four hundred and eighty bucks. Um, before I've turned a tractor on, before there's been any fertilizing happen, before I've even considered how I'm going to harvest it and where I'm going to send it. Um, and if you know, you know anything about commodity, you know, agriculture or even, you know, organic agriculture at scale, you know, we're looking, most farmers are looking, looking to input around 175 to $200 per acre, totally seed inputs, everything. And then to net somewhere between two and, you know, 220, 230, you know, 300. Um, there's a big boom in the soybean market this year. Uh, maybe some of you know the um, six or seven years ago, um, they they called a lot of pigs in China because um, there was a, a SARS outbreak with um, with their domestic pork production. And so once they were able to handle that, they re-upped domestic pork production, and now it's time to feed mm. all of the, you know close to a billion hogs that there are. And there's been some really tumultuous weather events in Brazil, another place where soybeans are, are um, gathered a lot for, for feeding over the world. So um, soybeans are at least around here in, in the South, people are booking soybeans at, at record prices. Mm. Um, so it's kind of, you know, at, 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 this, at this level, organic or not, it's sort of, um, you know, a, a bit of a, a casino, if you will. <laughs> if I have 400 <laughs> acres, you know, I'm going to lock in 200 acres at a at a break even plus price. You know, something I know I can keep the farm going at, and then I've got another, you know, 50 or 100 acres to to book early or book late or that kind of thing. So, just thinking about the mindset of of how, what hemp would have to do to be integrated into a larger scale system, it, it's like it's that kind of thing. You know, it's um. Lots of white papers, lots of experiments, but at the end of the day, the people who own own these farming assets really want to know three things. They want to know how much money, when do I get it, and what do I have to do to earn it. Um, and and that's you know we're we're still kind of far away from that uh, with that. Um, and and you know for us you know small artists and innovators that's a good thing. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh -huh. So these are our bales of hemp that we've been experimenting off of. Um, uh, yeah, we were able to get, get that in the barn. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, you can see our hemp is pretty well redded. You kind of have that dark brown 
um, light color. I've seen pictures of a lot of hemp. You see hemp that's really, really light in color. Um, you know, uh, odds are it hasn't been redded well yet. Uh, I've heard lots of different stuff about redding. Um, the best redded stuff I had set outside for three or four weeks. Um, they do a lot of tank redding in China. Uh, they do a lot of tank redding in Italy. Um, and tank redding is just a big, you know, like a field or a big, a big water um, retention area where you put a bunch of hemp in and then drain the water out afterwards. Um, typically, lots of chemical additives and other undesirable environmental things are, are used to, to um, process and post-process that in places where there's a lot of water redding. So we don't envision doing that much here. Um, additionally, I would say that, I mean, the best advice I've gotten about redding is that um, kind of like being a really good hay farmer. It's sort of, there's, there's an art to it and a science, but really maybe more art, you know, a good hay farmer can, you know, rub it, rub it between their fingers and say, hey, that's ready. Um, so I think, you know, there are some kind of, you know, rule of thumb, you know, um, in two or three weeks. Um, but I just, I just looked at it every day. And I didn't really have a, a rule for like how I wanted to look just when I could break it off and kind of peel it back. And um, yeah, there was a certain level at, at which I was like, yeah, let's just take it now. You know, <laughs> sometimes it depends on uh, one year, uh, uh, our first year, actually, 2016, we had a big hurricane, Hurricane Matthew come through North Carolina. And so I tried to harvest after redding. And then, um, you know, we had a, a tractor problem. And then the next day, the hurricane came through. And so it was another couple weeks um, after that. And that, that field stuff ended up being great. It used, we used it for lots of, of different kind of experiments. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that there's a a particular rule of thumb as of yet, but um, you can go to one more slide. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're getting to some of the fun stuff. This is a field decorticator I purchased from China in 2017. Um, it's from a company called Taizy, T-A-I-Z-Y. Um, I've done some work with, um, there's the hemp project in Western Minnesota, on the White Earth Reservation, uh, Winona LaDuke and, and, and their group over there um, do a lot of hemp production. They have a similar um, machine. I think it's the exact, it's from the same company. Um, so we talk from time to time about like, like machine modifications. Does it need to run faster? Does it need to run slower? Um, basically, this is just a diesel engine machine that if you put hemp in one side of it, it, it rips it, you know, with these two big mechanical rollers. You can, uh, just click one more slide and see what I'm talking about. Oh. There you go. So you can see it kind of, it needs to be powered down a little bit here. And frankly, these experiments where we learned that, yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to use a machine like this for roll baled hemp. Really, this machine really works better for long staple, you know, end to end bundled hemp. Mm -hmm. um, so there's design considerations, um, you know, in, in how you're gonna, how you're gonna grow, how you're gonna process. We were able to get some good things out of this, um, but, um, you know, just, you know, know that we're gonna use this machine this year, but to use this machine, we know that we can't roll bail. Um, so anyway, trying to figure some of that stuff out. We've talked about putting a conveyor belt next to this. Um, to feed in and feed out, work some processes. Um, it's hard to see, but there's a big arm on the back side of this that in the in the promotional video, you <laughs> stick camp through one end and it just flips perfect fiber out on the bar of the other end. So maybe we'll figure out how to get there one day. <laughs> They're processing green hemp though. Um, and it's a ripper, this machine. The video they sent me, when I asked how strong it was, they sent me a video of it chopping a tree. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, it's uh, it works. Uh, you can go one more slide. And just a little, pretty little artsy pick of uh, some of the different types of hemp. So from left to right, um, that's a, a straight up stalk. Um, you know, herd herd that can be broken up um, to the second image. You know, second little pile there. Um, herd is used. I'm telling you guys, probably stuff you already know is animal bedding. Um, really adventurous and I 
and, and I didn't mind that people are trying this in, in plastics. I've seen a really beautiful hemp brick made out of this before. There's a house in North Carolina actually that was commissioned that has a hemp panel. So it's like whatever there's supposed to be the drywall or actually insulation, I think is um, heard. Um, there's a kombucha company that's pretty popular. I think it's nationwide. It's called Bucci, if you've ever had it. But the women who run that company have a hemp Crete house in Asheville. Um, so yeah, there's some cool stuff with that happening around. Um, a lot of it, I mean, a lot of it's really neat. There is a lot of talk about it. Um, I, it would take me two hands to count the number of people who have told me that they personally are working with Elon Musk to develop hemp fiber like carbon fiber. So <laughs> it's hard, to, it's hard to believe things like that. Um, but, uh, but there's certainly, you know, the, uh, the hemp is really cool. The, the, the hype is, is certainly out there too. Um, the next three images are just hemp in various stages. So the first two, you've kind of got green, you know, unredded hemp, hemp that wasn't redded well. Uh, the two images after that are, are hemp that, that has been redded. And that final image over to the end there is a project we worked with, with, um, Bear, with Bear Fiber, got a carpenter here. And um, that is a, a blend, that's sliver that is 70% Pima cotton and 30% industrial hemp in North Carolina. Um, so it's, uh, it took a lot of steps and processes to get it to that. Um, but that's kind of, we were able to do that. We had a sliver we sent out for a few experiments with. Um, I ultimately think that, that, you know, hemp's entrance into the, the, the market in a real way will be more around industrial products, rope, um, you know, a high value product like, like I could see someone coming out with a line of like, like equine products, you know, halters and, and, and beds and things like that. Something that, that utilizes the sort of rough industrial nature of the crop um, and, and, and touches an industry where there's, there's high value consumers in it, you know, like the equine industry. Textiles are really exciting. Um, just from my perspective, there's so much stuff that has to be done to him to put it into a textile um, that that likely sort of like small regional projects and or um, you know uh, uh, textile applications would be more like around carpets and maybe socks and stuff like that you know um, but that's just that's just my opinion uh, you can go to the next slide uh, more fun stuff so one of the first things we did with hemp is we didn't have really a market application but we wanted to do a community um, show around it. So we, we um, organized seven or eight local textile artists in Durham and rented out or, or sent a proposal to um, a museum that was connected with the university and uh, did a big open house. And so here's some pictures of that. This is um, kind of a really rudimentary hackle. Um, so once hemp is, is, is cut down and redded and decorticated, uh, it goes through a, a hackling process, uh, very rudimentary you see here to kind of get the herd out of it, to separate the herd from the, the fiber. Um, the herd uh, is processed in, in Europe, they actually have four or five um, standard sizes for the herd. And it could be used from anything from chicken bedding, there's different sizes for horse bedding, um, different sizes for other applications. And it just goes into like a shaker machine. It's kind of similar to the machine that that separates your coins at the grocery store. Uh, it just separates it into different sizes and um, goes to different markets. So um, there is a, a um, business called Taproot Fiber Lab in Nova Scotia, and they have a, a set of machines um, and do a flax to linen project. And the machines that they use are really interesting um, examples of what a mechanized modular um, set of machines to process long staple fiber could look like. Um, so Taproot Fiber Lab, they've got a really cool hackling machine. Um, you can find their videos on YouTube. Uh, you can go to the next slide. One of the things we wanted to do is highlight North Carolina's textile history, so really make this place based. This is an old sock maker from the Renaissance Mill in Greensboro, North Carolina, about an hour from here. 
Uh, North Carolina is a huge textile infrastructure still and, and an even older history. Um, this is a machine that, that makes tube socks. As you can probably see, it, I could show a better angle from the top, but you thread line through the back um, there and then down through that, that middle sort of, um, uh, I can't even remember, I'm trying to remember what the technical term for that is, um, but you thread it around each of those um, braids and then roll it and it makes beautiful socks. So it was a nice little piece um, in addition to the space. You can go to the next slide. This um, is a really cool spot. So the canvas was purchased online from a place called Hemp Traders and it was like a hemp colored. And then um, this artist went to the spot that we grew the hemp and made a paint out of the clay in the ground where the hemp grew. And so the background is, is sort of the, the earth color, the you know, earth term color of that space. And then out in front, these 3D images of sort of like a quilted pattern. Um, that's hemp paper she used from the hemp that we, we made here. She put it into a process and, and pulped it and, and made pieces of paper. Um, so that was a really neat application. Um, so uh, you can go to one more slide. Um, this is just sort of playing with different textures. They took the entire, um, they took strips of the entire length of the stalk and then kind of stretched and weaved, very rough kind of process, um, just to kind of show how, how hemp in its early stages um, looks. Um, all this is hand harvested and that kind of stuff, by the way, just fly. This one I love, this one um, I traded actually to, uh, <laughs> to acquire for, uh, for a new museum one day or for something like that, maybe just to live in my house. This is a plastic um, that was made out of the hemp that we grew. Uh, hmm. One woman got some uh, stuff online. Uh, you can see kind of just really had, an, you know, inspiration to do something visual on this white wall. And so um, she got some instructions online and, and used, the, used the stuff and made some really, really neat plastic experiments. And they, they turned out really cool and really fit in the space. So hmm. we're excited about that. Uh, you can go one more. This is more of a history project. So um, there's some hemp canvases in the background. You can see kind of that big shot right in the middle. You've got um, some hemp stalks and some cotton um, poles from, from that, you know, with, with some hemp kind of weaved in the background. So just kind of playing with, with textures and, and just sort of the idea of what, what hemp can be. But um, these are some really exciting things that we wanted to spur some people's imagination about it. Um, you can go to the next slide. This was a really fun one. So I emailed 300 different breweries in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina has a, a, a craft beer um, market uh, industry that, that I, I think uh, I think would make Wisconsinites proud. Um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we've, we've got some, some really good and innovative brewers here. So I emailed like a 300 of them. Like one of them emailed me back. There's a really innovative guy in the Western North Carolina who does, um, has a brewery called Fanta Flora and everything they make comes out of, you know, is inspired with, um, with things that come out of the ground or come from the property. Um, he aged this beer uh, on hemp flour. Um, this was actually an example of a, a like almost like a, a waste um, reclamation project. I went to a friend who had an extraction company um, and took the sort of dust from the outside of the extract, um, you know, the extra stuff left over after, after supercritical or subcritical fluid um, washes hemp flowers and pulls cannabinoids out of it. Um, what was left over still had some really interesting um, sort of like, like property smell. And, and um, you know, of course, there's no CBD, no THC. And, and so it was um, trying to figure out, you know, there was a craze about trying to get hemp and beer. And, and so utilizing that quote unquote waste product was, I guess, was a good way to, to do that. So we sent it to there and they made a beer and they really liked it and they added it to the rotation. So they make one every year now. Um, but that's something we could do. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, these are more educational pieces, just to more highlight, you know, how you can spur on, you know, even a simple project like this, that woman there in the middle is the organizer of something called Carolina Fiber Fest. 
which brings four or 500 people and sheep farmers and alpaca farmers and textile artists from all over North Carolina every single year. Um, and after this exhibit, she was really excited to have us come to Fiberfest to really integrate hemp into it to start that conversation. So, um, you know, really this was the main goal to kind of create a space where people could look and have a conversation about it. Uh, you go one more slide. Same stuff there, really like that shot. Um, yeah, talking about this event. Uh, and then you can go one more slide. And that is a video in the background that we had made. Um, you can still find it on my on the website, one acre one dash acre dash exchange.com. There's a video up and it's basically nine minutes of the process and shows, you know, all the videos that I took on my phone for, <laughs> for a year and a half kind of spliced together. Um, so processes of how you plant, how you harvest, how you, you know, rudimentarily, you know, how you chop, how you, how you make stuff out of it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a wrap up. I think that's my last slide here. I talked a little bit longer than I wanted to, but I'm hoping we left enough time for questions. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about any part of that. If you want me to go into more in depth about the, the agriculture side, I know we have a lot of fiber artisans here. So, um, whatever you guys would like to talk more about, I hope it was, it was useful. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, so I'm going to jump in because I'm here and <laughs> not muted. Yeah. Our, so for this year, you said your seeds are already in. Um, what are, how do you decide what, what your plan is? Like, are you just sort of continuing on with your own research or is it coming from an external like idea? Like, where are you at in the process here in 2022? Yeah, so I hooked up with a group of people who do, um, who work in, in the Western North Carolina textile processing industry, and they have an existing contract with, um, with a, a, a material recycler. And so where I was this year in the process, you know, we figure we, we know well enough how to grow it at this point. We have had bad luck with uh, weather and other things, but in general, you know, it's getting the right seed, planting it on the right day, getting the right seed rate. Um, I've been working to try to get to a place where, you know, what, we meet with processors now and, and the question I always have is tell me the spec. If you can tell me exactly how you need it, you know, we can engineer a process on the farm to get it to you. Um, so my goal this year was to find somebody who fit that kind of parameter and um, this group out in Western North Carolina does. They have a particular market already. They have a, a process. And so they have a spec that they want to get it to. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to grow this acre and a half. We're going to uh, set up a field day, process it through this decorticator, and then kind of create that model and say, you know, here's, it, it costs us this much money in inputs. You know, it costs us this much to process it. Then we send it here. And then it went into a thing where now it's 10% of uh, a, a couch, <laughs> you know, or something like that, yeah. um, which I think is a really good application for it. And so then you have this kind of model, right? And so if this guy's paid, you know, and then you can kind of work it from there, right? So so what, what kind of values are we adding to that supply chain? You know, are we paying an equity price or are we paying bottom dollar for for, for the farming. So we can figure out the farming price, figure out the processing price, figure out this price, and then add 10% of it to the couch. And then they'll go to the people who buy the couch and say, hey, you want hemp in the couch? It's this much. Um, so we're in the process of, of really trying to drill down and integrate into a supply chain um, this year, as opposed to kind of broad experimentation, um, which I think is really good. But this year, our goal is, is a little more specific. Well, I have more questions, but I'm going to let, um, we have a lot of people here and you're welcome to either put in the chat if you have any questions or unmute yourself. I think we're a small enough group that we can um, moderate that. So um, let us know. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking to Tyler. All right. And I, okay. I'll ask one quick question first that's that's on the upstream agriculture part. Um, do you have an opinion about the appropriate time to harvest um, with maturity for uh, the redding and decorticating that you've done? Do you feel that 
Do you, do you take it till the males are flowering, the females are flowering? What have you found works best for your needs? Yeah. Um, well, I think this year what I want to do is take it right when I see any kind of flowering starting um, in the females. Um, before, I think that we've had some bad luck with not having the right seeding rate. And so it's like I wanted to get a little bit more crops and maybe I left it until I would I had never I've never taken a crop beyond when like 50 percent of, of them were flowering. Um, I, I would try to take it, you know, right when flowering starts. I'm hopeful to get a really good stand. And yeah, to answer your question, as soon as you can kind of see maybe 10, 20 percent of them starting to go, okay. then, then, you know, kind of growth is, is, is stopped. So that's my goal, at least. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Tyler, do you, I mean, do you feel like in, in your state, there's historic knowledge of this somewhere? I mean, you kind of talked about the tools being latent, you know, within farmers' garages or whatever, but like, are there other things that have sort of come to the surface in terms of knowledge, tools, I don't know, things that are helping you now? And then I have a second part of my question. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, I mean, just kind of familiarizing myself with just how oilseed crops have traditionally been grown in the South. And that kind of just, you know, demystifies it a little bit. You know, it's hemp, but really it's an oilseed crop. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of stuff at the University of Kentucky. The University of Kentucky's library um, is just filled with old research um, mm. stuff. Mm. Um, there is, I mean, North Carolina and Kentucky I guess traditionally we're, we're two of the biggest in Virginia. We're some of the biggest producers of hemp. So there is a lot of research back here, but we're finding that um, really the seed is kind of the key. You know, everyone comes here and puts the seed in the ground and then, then adjust to that. Um, but there is some stuff. There's a really great book I'll lift up um, for processing. The book is called Modern Hemp, Flax, and Jute spinning and twisted spinning and twisting and it's by a guy named herbert carter and it was published in 1907 and so modern you know modern mm -hmm. modern <laughs> um but uh it's got some really you know basically we mechanized quite soon after that and so it's got a lot of really great images and just sort of like thoughts about tensile strength and if you're really into that kind of stuff that's probably the best resource i've found mm -hmm. for the processing And then, uh, you know, f fast forward to now and the future, um, you know, we had Patricia Bishop here from um, Taproot Fiber Lab a couple years ago already. Um, have you seen any other, you know, companies sort of trying to sell that kind of equipment? I mean, it seems like that has to be the way forward, right? Like getting some sort of mid-scale equipment to start doing this, you know, for a collection of farmers or something like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I don't know of, 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 I mean, I know of some people who have tried various models. So there's, you know, there's a, a company in Omaha that I think is moving to Texas that um, has like a, a model to distribute, but I don't think they, I think it's almost like more of a franchise model with a machine. Um, there is, you know, a couple of like big bio labs that are trying to invest and in, and do some larger scale processing. Uh, I heard in Pennsylvania, there's this this thing called the hemp train, mm. which purports to take big bale hemp um, and, and, you know, send it into three different kind of mm. corridor conveyor stuff. Um, there's been a lot of energy around getting the D9 decorticator in the state around here. There seem to be a lot of people who are really excited about that um that's an australian machine mm. um so i you know i really think that how it's going to be made is i think there i mean there's machines that exist already to do what we needed to do um they're sitting on a boat um in china <laughs> most of them and um and and can be kind of ordered and shipped piecemeal but you know, we're, we're trying to work this year um, with the local machinist and, and somebody who has CAD. You know, I think really that's the next step is to really do it some sort of intentional design process and say, 
hey, you know, we've got this hemp that we can reliably get to this tensile strength. And so what, you know, what if we put it into this machine a hundred times, you know, does it does it come out the same, you know, kind of so that kind of level of, of testing and experimenting, I think, is is next. Mm -hmm. so. I see that we have someone here in autumn would like to ask a question. Hi, yes. Um, I just had a question about how you bailed the hemp because that was so cool. I've never seen it in like big hay bales like that. That's really cool. Do you have to worry? I know you said that um, you kind of don't let them all flower, but do you have to worry about getting rid of that or can you just like roll it in with the um, hay roller and just like keep it in the bundle or do you have to worry about like getting rid of the flowers because they might you know gunk it up or something yeah i mean once you know once they're on the ground and they red they they dry pretty quick and so the flowers nothing it's, it's like dust so it, it shouldn't gunk up your process too much um and then um yeah just just with a hay baler that's how we did it mm -hmm. that's cool so, thank you I guess a follow-up to that is to get it in the linear or line form that you're talking about. You talked about having harvesters all by hand. So is there, is, I'm guessing there's a tool somewhere in the middle, like between bailing and by hand, is there something that can like, I think you said that right after the mm -hmm. thing comes and cuts, there could be something that comes and gathers it in a more linear fashion. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, well, there's, there's been some talk about like, you know, and people have wild and interesting ideas, which are always lovely. Um, you know, like, like one farmer had the idea of redding it in place, right? Like just letting it, you know, sit in the field, post flower, just sit, sit, sit. Huh. And then, you know, wheat bind, you know, bind it like you would wheat. I, I really think that doing it like that, like getting a reaper binder kind of machine that, that you know, like a, like a PTO kind of machine and then rolling through that is, is the mechanized way to do that in the middle. Um, but right now, you know, knowing that our, the other way to do it is to design a better decortication machine that, that can take world build hemp. Um, and I think that's probably the way that the industry is, is moving. You know, they want to be able to, to grow 10,000 acres and, and receive right. 10,000 acres, you know? Right. So, um, yeah. So, so what we're doing this year is just going to bring it out of the field, unroll it, and so that we have an acre of hemp and, and you know, one smaller space and then just start picking. So that's our, that's our in-between option this year. So. It just feels like there's so much invention that's still necessary, you know, to, to get all around this, this problem, you know, so much creative problem solving that to happen. It's. I think, I don't know how you feel Shelby, but I feel like it's a little bit daunting and a little bit exciting at the same time, right? Cause it feels like no one's mastered it. And so like, it's an open playing field still. Yeah, I mean, I feel that way. I mean, it's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, yeah, I, I think like a slow, steady sort of success will look like a thousand failures, you know, with this crop. Um, there are people coming more online and, you know, there are, there are machines that we'll need to invest in to kind of really take it to the next step. I mean, there's a level of, of cottonization, um, if you will. Cottonization meaning turning hemp into a, a, a form where it can be blended with cotton, which is really what most of the textile infrastructure here is, is geared for. for because 90%, you know, more than that, you know, 98% of the U.S. textile infrastructure is built to handle short staple fibers. Mm -hmm. And so adding to that market, you know, most of the research is on, well, how do we get this rough long staple fiber that has traditionally made rope <laughs> into a process that we can weave it into a t-shirt? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of work that has to happen to that. And also I'm just not sure that that's the best route for this crop, mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's, that's just my opinion.
I agree. <laughs> I don't know if it's to me. It, it makes it. It seems like the thing that's so magical about the hemp is is the line is this continuous line, you know. And then so to intentionally shorten it to to mock a different fiber, you know, we're doing that for ease of a processing down the end road because we have those tools, you know, versus right. trying to like, you know, have new processes designed for that particular thing. So it, it, you know. I'm with thinking you. Right? about it in new ways. I think thinking about it in new ways is really the key, right? The best success I've had with hemp is as a cover crop. It's a really incredible cover crop. We had a uh, hemp that we grew that didn't really pan out one year. We just let it, you know, cut it down and let it lay fallow over the field. And then Jeff planted soybeans in it in the next year. We don't have hard data on it, but those soybeans were incredible. There was droughts all around, but the soybeans were great. So not that I want to put, you know, $500 of seed down as a cover crop <laughs> per acre. Um, but, you know, as it becomes more, you know, available, you know, these kinds of little ideas are great. I mean, maybe you get the line, you know, from it and then you take that herd and you throw that back on the, on the field as sort of a really spongy carbon yeah. application. Absolutely. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Need a think tank. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tyler, um, I could go on talking to you all day, but um, tomorrow we have a, for those of you still here, we have, um, we're kind of going to do in real life what Tyler has outlined with our, with our materials. I've had some um, tools built from some really old plans, some hand um, have processing tools, and they're beautiful and gorgeous, made by a local woodworker. We're going to pull all those out. We have um, the hemp that Shelby grew for us here, right? outside of Madison. And we're gonna sort of show you where we are. I can't pretend that we're great at spinning it. I, I will not attest to that yet, but um, we had to start somewhere and we're still in those early phases of like, just dealing with what we have, seeing how it gets through those hackles, trying to figure out the feel of it at the end. So we're, we're welcoming everyone who wants to come to the workshop and grateful to you, Tyler, for um, sort of laying the sort of bigger picture of where we might be going and what it's like to grow it and translate it into a textile. So thank you for joining us tonight. This is what I inherited. Oh, yay, Shelby. The hackle from the um, University of Wisconsin Extension program, uh, which I keep on a very high shelf because I do not want to impale myself on it, but uh, it's a Gorgeous. pretty intensive hackle. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, Hell Shelby, I think you're holding out on us. You need to bring that tomorrow. Yes, I will. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and we hope to see you um, tomorrow at the workshop. And then our next, it's not next week, but the following week, we're going to have a hempcrete workshop. His next week, Marian. <laughs> what is next week already? Okay, sorry. Um, what was the date of that? Do you have it, Shelby, in front of you? Um, anyway, if you, if you registered for this, you can register for that, um, talk, and then it'll be followed by a workshop next week, but thank you so much. And everyone online says, thank you. Great, great, great. Thank you. So thanks. Right. I'll stop recording.